Okay, everyone, I've been given the nod to kick off while people are bringing themselves back here. I am Tiana Nairn. I am the Group Manager of Policy for LMS Energy. I'm also the Chair of the Renewable Gas Alliance for Bioenergy Australia. Uh, LMS is delighted to be helping support today's event and it's fantastic having so many of you in the room together here today. Thank you very much to the Bioenergy Australia team for a great event. So LMS Energy is a bioenergy company and we're committed to being a leading bioenergy company organically powering the circular economy. And so here, you know, as well as renewable energy, we want to see materials flowing. And our role in that is around capturing landfill biogas from contaminated organic wastes and working with anaerobic digestion in respect of suitable organic waste streams. We're also very proud to be involved with Helmont Energy, having taken out a 50% share in their company, and it'll be my pleasure to say a bit more about Mark Yonker from Helmont in a moment. Uh, we focus on urban waste streams. Helmont is an agricultural AD company, so it's a natural synergy to really help drive change in capturing the energy, nutrients and heat from our organic matter. LMS Energy has been around for a long time, 40 years. It's a third generation company at this point. And throughout that entire period, it's had a strong history of innovation. It pioneered landfill biogas capture in Australia. It pioneered solar on land, active landfill areas. And now I'd like to highlight that we are also in the midst of constructing an Australian manufactured dry digester with patent pending, so our own design. So we'll be hopefully able to share more about that in our future gatherings. LMS Energy offers a complete in-house service uh, to support our clients. We don't own or operate any landfills, but we are a bioenergy company and we manage the gas fields, we design them, install them, operate them, and then take that through to, buy, to capture the biogas, which at this point in time gets generated into electricity. We then also manage all of the electricity and carbon products for our customers. Now, we are a biogas specialist, so with uh, anaerobic digestion developing, we also work with AD facilities. So through this history of innovation and a strong family culture, uh, LMS has grown to be a very large company with 210 employees and 200 petajoules of contracted biomethane reserves to 2040. That means we, that, that we have the largest existing contracted bioenergy reserves in Australia. So this morning we've been hearing about all the wonderful opportunities for people wanting to use bioenergy. We're here and ready to talk with you about those opportunities. And from this, you know, a big part of why we're all here, uh, making such a diff difference to our carbon profile. So we're actually Australia's largest carbon abatement company, responsible for about 15% of all emissions under the Emissions Reduction Fund. And so saving over four and a half million tonnes of carbon a year at this point and growing. So we're pleased to be part of this wonderful movement. And now I'd like to move to introducing uh, Mark Yonker, who is the managing, oh, sorry, I'm just gonna, who is the managing director of Helmont Energy. Mark has over 20 years experience developing bioenergy and power projects, including having been responsible for global growth and the commercialization of new renewable technologies for EDL. Mark has developed and project managed re renewable and remote power projects across Australia, North America, the UK and Europe. In 2020, uh, recognising the untapped potential of agricultural waste in Australia, Helmont Energy was founded. And uh, using this vision of making more of our agricultural waste, Helmont is actively developing bioenergy projects which support the agricultural industry, remote and regional Australia. 
This map here is from Australia's Bioenergy Roadmap. It highlights the opportunities from waste, which LMS is a part of. It highlights the agricultural residue opportunities, with Helmont being a part. Agriculture is 41% of this opportunity nationally, according to the roadmap, and it's my pleasure to open the agricultural farming and water discussion. Thank you. Well, what, a, what an intro. Thank you, Tiana. That's, um, and thank you for the, the work that you're doing uh, on behalf of the industry for the Renewable Gas Association. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here today uh, talking about you know, the opportunity from bioenergy um, if it wasn't for Bioenergy Australia and some of the volunteer from, uh, from that organisation, including Tiana and others who, who lead working groups to support um, this sector. Um, so what an exciting time to be here. Uh, there is a lot going on. Uh, two years is a, you know, it's not a very long time, but in two years we now know what biomethane is, we know what the definition of SAF is, uh, we're talking about digestate, and we're looking across to other markets to see what's going on in other markets with regards to bioenergy. Uh, as Tiana mentioned, we're passionate about bioenergy, we're, we're passionate about supporting agriculture. Um, and the reason we like bioenergy is because, you know, it's the oldest renewable technology in the world and, and the technology is proven. Um, and, you know, we only need to look at what's happening in North America uh, and in Europe to see that, you know, there's a large bioenergy resource being commercialised um, and it's been commercialised in the form of energy that's supplying hard to abate sectors, so natural gas, um, transport fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, renewable heat. Uh, so it's really pleasing to see uh, in 2021, ARENA published their bioenergy roadmap and, uh, and, and pleasing to see that three uh, technologies or three sectors were being pri prioritised or recommended to be prioritised, that being renewable heat, uh, renewable gas and sustainable aviation fuel. Um, <clears throat> so in Australia, bioenergy has been around for 30 odd years. Um, the sugar industry is actually the largest bioenergy contributor to the, uh, to the market. There's, I think I'll get this number wrong, David, 438 megawatts of power generation, 65 million litres of ethanol being produced from, from sugar. Um, behind that's the landfill gas industry. There's probably around 200 megawatts of power gen from landfill gas. Um, and then there are some biomass projects uh, which provide renewable heat. But the reality is that there are more project failures than there are project successes. And, and that is the key issue that this industry faces. You know, we want to invest in this sector, but we need to invest with stable policy that will support a price signal or support the incentives needed for, for bioenergy. Uh, it is true that there are customers looking to buy the product um, and there is feedstock available to produce the product. Um, but we will get to a point where you know, the, the, the cost disadvantage um, you know, given to those uh, consumers will make it very difficult for this industry to thrive. Um, so we only need to look at what happens where there is stable policy in the US and, and, uh, and in Europe where there are feed-in tariffs, there's a renewable fuel standard, and we can see from those markets where there has been exponential growth. So today, um, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce the speakers. So we have, um, and I might have the order wrong, guys. So, uh, so we've got Sam Cully from uh, the University of Adelaide and the Future Fuels CRC, who will talk to us, talk to us about the potential for bio hubs throughout the Australian um, agricultural regions. Um, uh, David Rin will bring that to life with some of the uh, examples that his firm has looked at um, through the Australian Millers, uh, Sugar Millers Council, um, including SAF and, and biomethane. Uh, and Greg uh, from the Burdekin Renewable Fuels will talk to us about his exciting project 
and the opportunity to um, create renewable fuels here in Queensland. Um, pleased to be presenting Ben Edser from AAM, uh, one of the largest agricultural funds in Australia. Uh, and we'll hear Ben talk about uh, the Murray Bridge biomethane project and some of the barriers that that project is facing. Um, Elliot Stewart uh, will talk to us about wastewater opportunities. Stephanie Solanis from, uh, from Yarra Valley Water, water will also talk to us about um, food uh, diversion projects and, and the good work that they're doing creating behind the meter generation from the diversion of food waste. Uh, and Joanna Johnson will talk to us about uh, her project which is uh, utilising biosolids uh, at, uh, at uh, Logan City Council. So, um, so can we just uh, welcome Sam to the stage? Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, Tiana, as well, for the introduction. Uh, we have the same sort of starting point here, which is the um, bioenergy roadmap for Australia. This is sort of an important graph for us, showing the theoretical upper limit, the bioenergy potential. And we've done a bit of, bit of work to look at where the starting point might be to start to utilise some of this energy. So the technology we're looking at is um, sort of large-scale agricultural hubs producing biomethane for grid injection into the pipelines. So we're trying to understand how many petajoules each year we can get into the pipelines. And the sort of feedstocks we're starting with is this large-scale agricultural waste collection. Um, we know there are projects that will be emerging from wastewater treatment plants and landfill, but we're really looking for these, uh, these large scalable sort of projects. Uh, and this very much fits into the wider picture of the renewable energy transition, where hopefully biomethane production can stand alongside hydrogen and all the other renewables uh, to meet our targets by uh, 2030 and 2050. So what are some of the uh, challenges and complexities sort of facing these projects that are emerging? What are the main factors we need to understand before we can start to build these projects? Well, we need to know where the feedstock is and more importantly, what its current utilisation is. Um, we need to know how close it is to critical infrastructure, like the gas pipelines, but also options to store the biomethane. We need to know when in the year the feedstock's available. That's an important factor I'll uh, be highlighting at the end of the talk. Um, what role will government policy play uh, in making these projects commercially viable? Will it be better to build one centralised hub or much smaller distributed hubs to capture this waste? And also at the plant scale, uh, how should we be operating these and how should we be managing the byproducts like uh, CO2 and digestate that you get from this technology? So our project is focused very broadly on understanding how these factors translate into two key questions around location and commercial viability at these plants. So what we've started with is building a prototype tool in order to understand how these factors map in to the um, commercial viability of these projects. So what I'm showing here is a heat map across Australia if the LCOE, if you were to build a plant there. And I'll be unpacking where this estimate comes from but this is sort of a, a high level dollar per gigajoule production, just to give an idea of where in Australia uh, the most commercially viable starts would start to emerge. And it lets us uh, answer some of these sort of key questions around how these uncertain factors give us this. We want people to be able to change the assumptions themselves and uh, come to this with your own project in mind and understand um, where the most viable locations for your project might be. So we have these uh, factors here around the location, and also factors here around uh, policy and um, commercial viability of the projects. So the work underp underpinning this was um, an assessment we completed at the start of the year. Uh, it was the focus of a recent webinar, and that's available online. You can um, go into more detail through the Future Fuels CRC website. But running through it at a very high level, we want to understand how much energy is available from agricultural feedstock at each point, and then do some cost estimation of putting a plant there. So the key data behind our project comes from the uh, ABBA data set that some of you might be familiar with. I'm showing it here for uh, South Australia and Tasmania, estimates of the cereal straw residue. And you can access this yourselves for each state uh, through the Aremi National Mapping Infrastructure. It's a really good resource. We've taken that as a starting point. And what we've done is for nine different agricultural feedstock types, we've stitched them all together um, to sort of show how many tons per year of uh, feedstock area is available, 
at each sort of five by five kilometer scale. Um, this is showing cereal straw, so it's really just a map of the wheat belt. Um, but we also know sugarcane is a big factor here. And we have uh, fruits and manures and vegetable residue as well behind this sort of assessment. What we do is we combine that with the energy density with the feedstock types to understand the energy potential if you were to put a plant in each location around Australia. And so uh, what we're seeing here is, yeah, an energy density map for the petajoules per year, uh, just from that agricultural feedstock waste. The other key cost factor is the cost of transport. So we're looking here at transmission pipelines because we're really interested in these large scale projects. But as a part of our assessment, we've also looked at distribution hubs and um, proximity to other hydrogen infrastructure because there's a lot of interplay between these two, these two gas technologies. And then um, the remainder of the costing that comes in, we actually have a, another tool. It's a project level uh, commercial assessment tool. It sort of walks through the whole supply chain from um, feedstock utilization to biogas production, biomethane upgrading, which is a very important uh, step in the process before it goes into the pipeline, and then the cost of compression and, and grid injection. And what we're doing here at the moment is we're, um, we're sizing a plant for each point in Australia, assuming it's peak biomethane output, and then we're doing a costing, a capital estimate um, based on that sort of peak flow, and then understanding the operational cost behind it as well. So more detail is um, available through the Future for CIC around that particular project level assessment. But we um, take a lot of the costs and parameters from uh, Europe and America where this is sort of more proven technology. And what we sort of see uh, emerge here when you sort of take this high level view across Australia, uh, the regions where the LCOE is the lowest. And so we see around the sugarcane production in particular and closer to sort of critical infrastructure, we see dips in the LCOE. Uh, what we've pulled out is sort of, you know, for each state, what the first sort of 10 to 20 petajoules could sort of look like, um, at, given their proximity to gas pipelines and uh, how much of this is catchable. And uh, we sort of see a range in the LCOE. Um, it's sort of, sort of as low as around $10 a gigajoule, but um, more, more commonly around $20 a gigajoule. And just sort of um, a key insight around the uncertainty behind that range that sort of emerged from this sort of high level look is this question of when in the year the feedstock is available. Because we have nine different feedstock types here, but they're available for different periods of harvest throughout the year. So just to sort of show two key maps here, um, the map on the uh, right is sort of showing what happens if we assume that all this feedstock is readily available through the year for use. The LCOE comes right down. Whereas if you assume that the um, feedstock's only available at the point of harvest, then it's much higher uh, as a result. So this sort of suggests um, some sort of interest in need around um, energy crops or something to sort of round out that sort of process. So next steps for us are to sort of dive into the state level and start to pull in some of these other feedstock types. Um, and so if there's any interest in engaging with uh, Victorian and New South Wales maps, then please reach out to us and the Future Fuel CRC. Um, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, my name's David Wren. I'm the Director of Policy and Economics at the Australian Sugar Milling Council. A uh, bit of a disclaimer there. Um, Contents of my presentation, very rapid fire, but five key themes. In introduction to the ASMC. I'll touch on our bioenergy footprint as, a, as an industry. What's our mac macro agenda in terms of the next you know, period for the Australian sugar industry? As a subset, what is our bioenergy agenda? And I'll touch on some of the techno-economic findings of a recent significant study we did and next steps for us as the Australian milling sector. So introduction to ASMC, who are we? We're, we're the peak representative body for the sugar millers in, uh, in Australia. Uh, my members are those companies, uh, Wilma, Mackay Sugar, MSF, Tully, and Isis. Those five uh, companies alone make up 90% of the Australian sugar industry. Uh, they operate 16 mills in Queensland. You can see on the map there, 
Uh, that's the footprint of the Australian, or well, the Queensland and Australia, New South Wales, if you like, um, uh, sugar industry. You can see there where the mills are. We can't really see it. It's more the, the land of the cane that you can really see there. But um, you can see predominantly we're up and down the, the uh, east coast of Australia from northern New South Wales right up to, uh, up to Cairns and beyond. So it covers a very broad stretch of land. That footprint is over 450,000 hectares. So what's our, what's our bioenergy footprint at the moment? Well, as Mark uh, introduced in his opening comments, we're already kind of doing this stuff as, as, a, as an industry. We've got 438 megawatts of installed cogen power up and running right now. And we're about to begin our crush. And those turbines are up and running, almost up and running. Some have already started. And we are contributing to the energy problem, if not crisis, that we are seeing right here and now before us. We're exporting about 500,000 megawatt hours of our power and we're putting that heat and steam and that power back into the factories or the mills to keep those internal processes going. There is a 65 million litre bioethanol production uh, plant up there in, in Queensland as well. Um, and that's, that ethanol is used for a variety of purposes. We're importing power. Uh, when, when the crush isn't occurring and we don't have that big gas, uh, some of the mills do, do actually import uh, power at times. A feedstock, it's the word we're all talking about today. We've got considerable feedstock. In Queensland, we're purchasing around 30 million tonnes of cane per annum, and obviously we're crushing that cane, we're producing juice, and we're producing raw sugar. That raw sugar is exported to refineries abroad. But through that process, we are generating significant quantums of, of feedstock. Six million tonnes of trash, a million tonnes of molasses, nine million tonnes approximately of the gas, and the juice and the raw sugar, well, that's four million tonnes. We use diesel jennies as an auxiliary power source, which obviously there's a, there's a substitute um, opportunity there. And we're consuming diesel in our cane locos and our cane heavy and, our, and a heavy vehicle fleet. Again, there's another substitute option for us. So we've got it to uh, export, and we're looking for bio options to substitute some carbon intensive uh, consumption. We're an iconic industry. We've been around 130 plus years. Uh, it's also an industry under some uh, some pressure at the moment. Prices are good at the moment, but we can't rely on these, pr these prices for raw sugar forever and a day. Uh, we've, our problem statement is real, and it's keeping uh, the industry alert and, uh, and, and, and collaborating on, on solutions. Quite simply, our cane supply in trend terms is falling, uh, and it's causing mill underutilization, and it's pushing up our costs of raw sugar production. Uh, we've had some troubles diversifying our revenue stream away from raw sugar, and that's at times in the price cycle putting the industry under some financial stress. So what do we need going forward? Well, as I say, we produce around 30 million tonnes of cane per annum. We're trying to get that up to 34 million tonnes of cane per annum, and obviously that will come with, my bi with more byproduct availability. But that's only one half of the equation here. We need to get our mills running as effectively and efficiently as they can. We call it fill the mills, fill them up with, fill them up with cane. We've got 90% fixed costs in those mills. We need to bring those per unit costs down. How else, can we, how, how else can we shore up viability of the Australian sugar industry? Well, it's this conversation we're having today. Uh, we need a policy environment that supports value-add revenue diversification opportunities absolutely essential that we maximise the value of the sugar and we make our byproducts earn more and we get more value out of those byproducts than what we are doing right now. Those two objectives are complementary. Both are needed. We need higher volumes to create confidence uh, to invest in the biorefineries and the more cogen and the biomethane plants. So the two are mutually reinforcing objectives. 
What's our bioenergy agenda as a subset of that broader macro agenda? We asked LEK Consulting uh, back in late 21 to run the ruler over five bioenergy plays. Uh, as of today, given known cost structures, known revenues, market dynamics and policy settings, are these things uh, commercial to us at a commercial rate of return um, under what we know today? <clears throat> and this assumes that we, as an industry, own, operate these facilities and, and these, uh, these bits of kit. So we looked at five, more cogen, more biofuels, but gas pelletization for, bagas, uh, for export, I should say, uh, more biomethane and green or turquoise hydrogen. The results were, were very interesting. Um, three of the five were considered, and it's my parlance, commercially prospective, um, but there's a role here for government. Um, I'm an economist. Uh, in, industry, in industry policy speak, we call this market failure. We are having difficulty bringing these commercial opportunities to commercial fruition. Uh, these are all challenging economics and challenging projects. More cogen, yes, it's commercially prospective and we're seeing it today. The market is screaming for diversified energy supply. We can put another thousand megawatts of cogen into the grid. Uh, but is it economic? It's borderline. Um, is more government help needed? It is. What would help make more cogen projects economic and to mitigate some of the risk associated with the extreme price volatility we're seeing in the NEM at the moment? Well, three things. Uh, our cost of capital is, I won't say what our cost of capital is, but um, if we could get government cost of capital at 2%, a bond rate cost of capital, uh, to build more cogen plant, that would drastically improve the economics of a cogen plant. A long-term PPA, you just got to look at the volatility we've seen in the NEM over the last 12 months. We were dispatching energy at minus $500 a megawatt hour during the crush last year. Today we're earning considerably more and it's got a big, a big uh, dollar sign in front of it, you know, $600, $700 until they put the price cap on. So extreme volatility. How do you take that volatility into account when trying to go to a financial investment decision with some of these huge outlays? It's very, very difficult. A long-term PPA would assist a power purchase agreement or an offtake agreement for that power. Bear in mind, cogen is synchronous. It, it gives inertia to the grid. It aids grid reliability and stability and massive carbon abatement. So we've got all the attributes of what policymakers are wanting out of new uh, power supply. And we can be a firming option or we can be a, a baseload option as well. More biofuels, then that co is code for SAF. Um, is a perspective? Absolutely. Is more government help needed? Yes. What do we need? R&D incentives. We need fuel supply incentives, and we do like low emissions fuel standards or mandates as policy instruments. And obviously some consumer incentives are needed in there. I won't touch on gas pelletization. Biomethane, yes, another attractive play for us, especially where there's proximity to pipelines in Queensland. What do we need? Again, low cost capital. 2% bond rate capital would, would help get projects over the line. ACUs, and there is a methodology in train to develop a, an ERF methodology for the gas and or trash to be converted to biomethane. And if we could pocket some ACUs, that would greatly assist the economics of projects. So next steps, final slide. Concentrate on the first two. This is really about kicking the tires still on these projects. We're not ready to make big financial decisions just at the moment. The market is moving rapidly. The technology is moving rapidly. Uh, the markets are moving rapidly. So we need to do more techno-economic assessments, more pre-fees, more fees to really understand where we're going to put our resources going forward in terms of that. We can only use that one tonne of gas once and, and where's, the best op where's the best option for it going forward. Um, so wrapping up, we like these conversations, we need to learn, 
We need to understand how we can get these costs down. Uh, but there is really a deep policy discussion that needs to be had with government as a partner with our respective industries to bring some of these um, commercial prospects to, um, to bear. So thanks very much. <laughs>
Okay, these are our project benefits for our region, where our region is, um, has been suffering. Uh, the, the returns from just the raw sugar have been, haven't been great over time with increased costs in growing the crop. So uh, we are looking to increase our revenues back and increase the amount of jobs for our communities as well. Okay, so phase two, we'll be moving towards our regulatory approvals, as you can see there, and our phase three construction. Um, in the future, we're looking to, to expand our B Green into B Greener, and um, as we move down the track further, further towards once the costs of around the uh, green hydrogen from solar and wind, we'll look to hopefully bring that technology on board as well. Uh, Project B Greener is, is hoping to, instead of going for the PET market, the PET plastics, we'll look to make PEF as well. So um, these markets are growing year by year. Um, and that's about it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm pretty nervous today. And, um, but thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. You spoke well, mate. Righto. Well, we've heard a bit about the um, food and fuel and the farmer uh, today, and it's been a pretty hot topic about the criticality of of feedstock. So, um, here to talk to you a little bit about um, AM, what we're up to, where uh, where our assets are, and how. Um, we're pretty motivated to, to help get this whole um, sector driving forward and I'll talk to you a bit about a project that we're working on with the Helmont guys as well. Um, so who are we? Why am I here to talk to you about it today? So AIM Investment Group. Um, so there's a map there, uh, probably could have made it a little bit bigger, but we are dotted all over the country, all the way from the Northern Territory, uh, where we've got about a million acres in Northern, Northern Australia where we run beef cattle. Um, we've got 250,000 acres through Western Queensland there. Uh, again, running organic sheep and cattle. 25,000 acres through Central New South Wales, where we're running uh, sheep uh, cropping. We produce uh, 20 million meat chickens down in, in South Australia at two complexes. Um, at a free range complex, where we do about 10 million chickens. And um, uh, another complex there at Murray Bridge. Um, we talk about um, food and fibre and potential competition, but interestingly, some of these industries, it's very symbiotic and um, synergistic where we can still, obviously, meat chickens and in the chicken industry, you've got the, um, we've got a huge amount of byproduct. We're down there, we're, we're generating about 40,000 tonnes of poultry manure between the two complexes. We're also integrated in the softwood timber industry, three assets. Um, uh, big one down in the Green Triangle in Mount Gambier, where we process about 400,000 tonnes of softwood plantation renewable timber, um, a, a, a business in Bathurst and also a business in Queensland. So, uh, uh, interesting or uniquely enough, so AEM, we're um, a bit different in the uh, assets and operations, so it's our people all the way down on the ground. Um, we're diversified across a number of agricultural sectors, um, and um, we've got the ability to actually make a bit of the difference and focus, focus on a few of these things. So a few people talked today a little bit about sustainability and there's a, there's a big focus today obviously around the topic around emissions, but we always think about this as well as we, we'd like to ensure that we broaden that from, a, uh, from the perspective of people, planet and prosperity. We see it as a huge, um, uh, a huge obligation of ourselves because oft often we are what we like to call reinvigorating the um, regional communities by often we're taking over succession assets and, and putting young people back into um, communities. So we've got 700 people that uh, work with us for the group across the country. Um, and uh, yeah, we are acutely aware of the, the, the critical nature of people in our communities, that is for sure. So we probably touched on this a little bit, but yeah, we're obviously diversified across a few different sectors. It's our active management, it's us all the way down on the ground and it's our, it's our people. We see that as a bit of a, 
a point of difference as well. And I'll tell you a little bit about a bit of a case study um, at the poultry enterprise. Um, because unlike many where uh, you may have the, the, the asset, but if you're not operating it, how is that ability to actually go all the way through and make, and make, those, make those differences? So I'll talk to you a little bit about this because it's a, I'd call it a, a, a sustainability and renewable energy journey, which we feel we're, we're constantly evolving and, and, and progressing around. So we started, we started this is, a, this is a, an energy management platform, if you like. It's just a snip of it. It was from uh, this morning just before the uh, wholesale network shot back up. Um, but uh, look, we've got, um, there's seven farms there. Uh, there's six sheds per farm. We've actually got 200 kilowatts on each of the farms, so there's 1.4 megawatts. Um, at five of the seven farms, we've got Tesla batteries. The reason we didn't do seven of the seven is we couldn't get the exact battery configuration to scale up with the size of the, the size of the farms. But we did put in place a virtual metering system across the whole complex, and we've we've also got diesel gensets on the farm. So we effectively are balancing and managing our renewable energy load and infrastructure across the complex um, based on whatever the wholesale network is at the time. So we, we, we built this ourselves and we've got an algorithm that sits in behind it and based on whatever the wholesale pricing is, it'll talk to and tell the infrastructure what to do. So you can see down in the bottom right hand corner there since we, since we, we spent about $5 million on the infrastructure at this asset to date and sustainability can be good business um, is a key ethos that we like to apply and that we've significantly reduced CO2 equivalents but also saving, uh, saving some money on, um, on power pricing as well and the ability to export out into the network. So um, uh, at this same complex as well where, um, uh, where we generate about or produce about 20,000 tonnes of, um, of poultry manure, we're currently processing that and we've always had a vision for some time since, look, I travelled around... On, on, an, on an Uffield scholarship on this back in 2016, travelling around the, wor the world, looking at what they're doing in the UK and the US, and always had a vision to try and um, um, to try and value add further and um, uh, do some um, waste value add with um, uh, with with biomethane or anaerobic digestion or something like that. So we, we've. We've, we've, we've implemented on this part of, of the aspect, but we're really at this next stage, which I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more now, which is around the um, um, biomethane project at, um, at, at Murray Bridge. So I've been wanting to do something like this for some time, and it was, um, it was really fortunate to be able to uh, link up with the, um, with the Helmont guys and, and look to try and bring together um, some critical aspects. We've talked a lot about the critical, critical nature of um, of feedstock, so um, the ability to come together uh, and actually supply the feedstock to the plant and also deal with it at the other end um, from a digestate was critical in coming together, but there were, there were some real holes and gaps that we couldn't solve ourselves. So um, we've come together with the Helmont guys and we're, um, uh, we're getting pretty close, aren't we, Mark? Um, which is good, but as, as Mark touched on, look, there are some real hurdles. The, these projects are not no-brainers. Um, by any means, it needs a significant um, capital assistance, and we are we're very happy to invest in things, as you can see. But the, it still does have to meet some sort of minimum uh, investment hurdle rate. Um, so it needs an, it needs these it needs an additional revenue stream outside of just selling electricity or just base load um, gas stuff. It does need this premium, or it does need some capital support. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I will um, I'll buzz through this quickly. But obviously. The vision is to be able to do many more of these, get this first one up and going. Um, there's many more hubs closely related to um, infrastructure where there's agricultural feedstock where we can come in and um, we'd, we'd love to see many more of these um, and we'd love to be critically part of that of working with the Helmont guys to, to deliver it because there is, um, there is some significant opportunity out there. Third time you've seen this map in a couple of minutes. That's me done. Thank you. Like, as I said, the people, um, it's so key to what we're doing. Um, and, uh, and, and, yeah, thanks very much for your attention today. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much to Bioenergy Australia for having me here today. I'm Elliot Stewart, Liverpool Communities Advisor from the Water Services Association of Australia. 
first one, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land we're on today, which is the Turbal people of this land called Mianjin. I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Wassa is the peak body for the urban water industry in Australia and parts of New Zealand. We represent around 110 uh, water utilities. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few in Queensland too, um, both the big guys like urban utilities in Brisbane and down to small councils too. Uh, we are really seeing bioenergy within the context of the circular economy and we've seen a few slides on circular economy so far but not a whole lot so um, a circular world is one where the outputs of one process can be inputs to another and our industry has got a wealth of opportunities. At the core of our ability in circular economy is our wastewater treatment facilities um, and for the sector wastewater treatment is no longer only about pollution control and public health it's actually also about um, increasingly energy and resource recovery. So we've been doing this for a long time and the picture is um, the opening of the Werribee treatment plant in Melbourne in 1892. We know how to manage liquid waste um, and we're starting to apply that knowledge to solid waste in order to um, uh, maximise our biogas opportunities. Uh, we want to partner with bioenergy sector players especially feedstock providers, and we've got some great examples um, now of mutual benefits from co-locating near our sewage treatment facilities. So we think we're key to capturing full value from bioenergy. So here's um, a snapshot of our challenges as a sector. We know water, we know sewage. Um, we've had to learn about the electricity market. We don't know the gas market in the same way. Um, we're struggling with access to reliable market information that can help us make more informed investment decisions. Um, and we're also regulated businesses um, with customers and um, shareholders that don't like bill increases. So um, that's really important for us. Um, we've heard that feedstock is the new location, location, location. That's certainly true um, for us as well. In order to invest in infrastructure to produce more biogas, we need both market intelligence to give us certainty around the feedstock supply, quality, consistency, timing and seasonality, but also long-term supply agreements while our infrastructure is paid off. And this really plays into a scale challenge too. So our small scale wastewater treatment plants are unlikely to become um, significant biogas producers um, unless there is significant external feedstock available. So um, regional utilities will, will be really looking to partner with agricultural producers um, such as the cane and sugar industry to overcome this. In, ter whoops. In terms of uh, policy, um, you know, the previous federal government has been a bit challenging when it comes to energy policy, as we all know. Um, hopefully that changes, but states have been going off in their own direction. Um, and the bioenergy roadmap was itself a bit delayed too. So we now have some challenges with policy alignment across state and federal level. In addition to our own uh, existing challenges around differing regulatory requirements, especially those related to emissions reduction. Um, and this was highlighted in the recent Energy from Waste Roadmap, an excellent paper, I might add, by the Waste Management and Resource Recovery Association of Australia. For example, in the ACT, um, they see waste to energy as a low value resource recovery method. So that's putting people like Icon Water, our member in Canberra, in a bit of a challenging space. In 2018, the water industry generated 18% of its electricity demand from on-site renewables. That's the graph on the right there. 67% um, of that was from biogas. Um, but that, so that shows you that we're using our biogas mostly behind the meter at the moment or flaring it, um, which is cost effective and um, in most cases better for the environment too. So in, unfortunately for us at the moment, it's still uneconomic to scrub biogas to produce biomethane and send into the grid using sewage alone. So um, apart from cases where there are some gas gates located happily within our treatment plants, um, such as North East Waters, West Wodonga plant, um, to produce more biogas, we need access to external feedstock and we also need to invest in different technologies like digesters and cogen to be able to utilise it. Many utilities just aren't in that finan financial position at the moment um, and we're seeing you know, interest rates going up, cost of capital going up. Um, so unless the business case is really strong, um, it's, it's challenging without external funding. Um, most, many utilities still have lagoon-based treatment so they can't actually add FOGO into it. Um, 
and that's why there aren't a great deal of export to grid projects coming out of our sector at the moment. The best examples are where utilities have been able to access that feedstock and um, my colleagues from Yarra Valley Water will be and talking about that. Um, it's a real change in mindset for our sector. We're going from needing to balance our uh, COD at our treatment plants to minimise the amount of biogas produced um, and therefore flared to encouraging our customers to send us more food waste and high strength trade waste to produce more biogas. So it's a real change in mindset. Um, contaminants such as PFAS and microplastics might be um, a, a challenge for us in the future with um, this resource recovery stuff too. Uh, this is a graph that was provided to me from Sydney Water showing the energy potential of their wastewater streams versus the amount of grid electricity they use. Um, it's from 2015-16, so it's a few years old, but it's roughly two and a half times their total energy use, and that's without food waste being added. In terms of opportunities, um, you know I'm a water nerd when I say that municipal sewage is an amazing thing. It contains energy and a range of really re useful resources and we're just starting to tap into that potential now. Um, the energy potential is around five times the energy needed to run activated sludge processes. Re recovering this can be difficult though from an economic emissions and environmental perspective and we've really needed arena funding in many cases to get projects to delivery. Co-location is important and helps with feedstock certainty but um, also helps to maximise offtake opportunities. Um, with LGCs ending at 2030 at this stage, water utilities are probably looking at how they can scale up their bioenergy opportunities um, to maximise LGCs procured prior to that date. And with current gas and power prices, we might, might also have another big driver to scale up. Um, I recently changed my electricity provider at home and I've paid extra for 100% green power. Um, I wanted to do the same with gas, but there is no green gas providers in the market. Um, the previous government had their gas-led recovery policy and it's um, unclear whether Labor will take that forward, um, but perhaps a green gas target would assist in scaling up the industry and providing more opportunities to harness the potential in the water sector. This is a good example from an uh, international water sector in Denmark and shows where wastewater treatment is likely going to be going in the future, a fully integrated water, waste and resource recovery system and more facilities like this will be needed in Australia to meet our National Waste Policy, Policy Action Plan. This is just a snapshot of some of the fantastic projects that our members are doing at the moment. Um, Yarra Valley Water will be talking about their re-waste project and obviously Logan there too, um, but Bowen Water um, and Sydney Water are the two other standouts at the moment. That's it for me. Thank you. because I'm small. Couldn't have timed those two better if we tried. So, um, let me get this sorted. Oh. Cool. Right. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about Yarra Valley Water's uh, Waste to Energy Program. That's our site, as you can see. Um, I'll kick off with um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on today and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, um, seven minutes, not a lot of time. Um, I thought I'd start off by giving a quick context of what our project is um, and how it came to be. So, ReWaste is a, um, essentially a, a, a net zero initiative by Yarra Valley Water and um, the, the whole concept kicked off uh, over a decade ago when RMD uh, did some travelling over to the UK and saw these facilities all over the place uh, and thought, why can't we do something like that back at home? So the discussion kicked off, the, the, the concept was um, researched and ultimately ended up delivering us with uh, rewaste. So a few, uh, few points about rewaste. We're located in the North Metropolitan Region um, of Melbourne and we're co-located with a uh, sewer treatment plant um, that serves that northern um, population of Melbourne. One of the points uh, just mentioned earlier was around the uh, restraints for the water industry um, as we are required to operate under the Water Act. Um, we're required to deliver water and sanitation services to the um, general population and um, that's really about it. Um, and we can't go off spending um, our uh, customers and residents' um, 
commercial customers uh, money on investing into risky infrastructure. So how did we get around that? Uh, we sought a permission once our business case was pretty solid um, and we were granted a permission by the Minister to undertake unregulated business um, as the Yarra Valley Water. Essentially that's where ReWaste was born. Uh, my job is to operate ReWaste as an unregulated business on behalf of Yarra Valley Water. So um, Yarra Valley Water is my main power customer. So we um, have them as our behind the meter um, power customer. And then we also um, made a, a very clear conscious decision in that business case that we wouldn't process biosolids or uh, sewer treatment plant sludge through our AD system. Uh, so what that means is that we process 100% um, commercial food waste out of the local uh, metropolitan food um, manufacturing industries and, and the like in the area um, into our facility. So at current, we're processing 33,000 tonnes and we're at our design capacity and we produce, should be about 700, um, in actual fact, um, 700 um, kilowatt hours per annum is our average that we have for power production. So that's a little bit about our plant. There you, you can see it there. Um, I thought I'd touch quickly on some of the points that might be of interest um, for anyone in, in the ag industry considering uh, looking at AD as a technology. Some of the questions that pop up are common, commonly for us um, and some of the concerns that Yarra Valley Water had uh, before they embarked on this endeavour, which has um, been really successful for us in the end. So waste supply and quality. I'll repeat it again, location, location, location. Um, the location for us um, was critical in that decision to emit the biosolid component and focus purely on the waste commercial market. So um, the waste supply provides us with a gate fee revenue, um, which helps us to offset our costs for operation um, and allows us to develop a commercially viable business case for our, our particular facility. So, Waste supply comes from the food manufacturing industry, which is, um, has a strong presence in that northern area of um, Melbourne. We uh, take material from abattoirs, meat processors, um, you know, Spring Roll Manufacturing Company is an example. We've got the metropolitan market, um, wholesale markets up in that region as well, who do a really good job of cleaning up their waste um, for us to be able to receive that as well. Um, and we also take... A, quite a, a large volume of liquid um, commercial organic waste out of the food and beverage industry as well. We are starting to see an increase in what we call post-consumer um, feedstocks as well. So we've got restaurant and retail who are going through the effort of um, removing contamination and having really clean feedstocks that can then be brought to facilities like ours to avoid um, their waste going to landfill. So that's been a really positive um, thing that we try to support as best we can. So power supply quality for Yarra Valley Water was a really key concern. Um, you know, a treatment plant can't afford to lose power regularly or, or not have the power it needs to operate. So um, that has ended up being of absolutely no concern. <laughs> Our plant has been producing far more power than we um, anticipated and needed um, for the Behind the Meter partner, and we haven't had any complaints from them in our ability to deliver that power to them 24-7. Uh, so... Maintaining AD health was another concern. Obviously, Yarra Valley Water is no expert in AD technology, so um, that was that was a, a consideration that that was a particular concern for um, the Yarra Valley Water um, team in in accepting. We uh, alleviated that risk for us by engaging in a um, construction, uh, a design, construction and delivery um, contract with our partner. So um, they designed for us as per our um, specifications. They delivered it and they operated it. They have been operating it for us since the commissioning in 2016, um, which has allowed us to develop quite a good um, knowledge base around the, the technology and maintaining that system. Um, we, haven't, we haven't had any concerns with souring or, or issues with um, digester health outside of, you know, leaving, leaving a little bit of the, um, the textbook levels that we've been able to really manage and, and get on top of working really closely with our um, construction partner or operation partner now, really. Uh, regulation and policy. Uh, we're all going through that at the moment on the digestate side, but what I will say is um, I think we're on the cusp of, 
of seeing some change, particularly Victorian uh, regulation. I know Queensland um, has got a draft policy out now on the reuse of the digestate and end material. So we're, we're pretty positive to, um, to think that Victoria is going to follow in those footsteps in, in the very near future. So, um, yeah, feel free to ask some more questions later or catch me later if you wanted to um, get any more detail on those. So. I will hand over to uh, another water industry colleague, Joanna, who will talk about um, Biosolids Project. Hi, um, I'm Jo, I'm the Sustainable Solutions Lead for Logan Water, um, and I'm here to talk to you about the Biosolids Gasification Facility. First off, I'd like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Yagara people as the traditional custodians of the waterways and country on which we meet today. And yes, so the Logan Home Biosolids Gasification Facility received 6.23 million from um, ARENA for this project. So we've heard a lot about um, the water industry and um, Logan Home Wastewater Treatment Plant is our largest wastewater treatment plant uh, in the city of Logan. Uh, Logan. It treats about approximately 42 megalitres per day, and our main byproducts are odour, grit, and biosolids. So the focus of the Logan Home Wastewater Treatment Plant Gasification Facility was on how we deal with our biosolids and, and biosolids management. Um, so to give some context, biosolids or sewage sludge um, is the byproduct from a wastewater treatment plant, and our catchment is predominantly residential. So that's from household, kitchens, laundries, and bathrooms, um, with a 20% industrial kind of mix into the catchment. Um, what's most significant about our project was understanding that our current process only reduced our water content to um, our solids content to 13%. So when we were transporting our biosolids, we were mostly transporting water. Um, the Logan Home Wastewater Treatment Plant produced around 34,000 tonnes of biosolids per year and they were um, transported to the, the Darling Downs for application. Um, it costs around 30% of our total wastewater treatment plant costs and that's comparable to electricity. Um, we also recognised that there was a major risk to us with the end of waste code for biosolids in Queensland. It started to include um, PFAS limits. And so we knew that um, we were going to be at risk um, with these change in regulations. And we're seeing that currently with our other water utilities. Council also had a target um, to achieve carbon neutral operations by the end of 2022. So yes, that is this year. And our current biosolids management pro, um, process produces around 9,000 tonnes of carbon emissions. So we really needed to look at how to, we could move towards a circular economy um, and how we were going to do this. Um, so as, we, as I said, our biosolids management strategy in 2019 recognised that we had to future-proof ourselves um, and the only way we could do that was A, reducing our water content of our biosolids, um, producing a more sustainable um, biosolids, so looking at our stability of our biosolids, and then looking at the biosolids as a calorific value, so really looking at that energy potential. Um, Yes, and that's what we just talked about. And yes, there's solar panels. Um, so the solution was gasification. Um, this isn't new technology. It's been used in the ag sector um, for biomass like cane, macadamia shells, green waste. Um, but what was innovative was applying that to a wastewater treatment plant biosolids because it's 85% water. Um, and so we were able to do that through adaptation of the existing technology. And um, I'll go through the process side of it. So. The dewatering um, is done through centrifuges, which gets us to tw the biosolids from 14% to 23% dry. It then goes through belt dryers, which gets it to 90% dry. And then that goes to the gasifier where we're able to carbonise the biosolids into biochar and also produce a biogas. So that's another version of that. So as I was saying, the centrifuges, 23%. Then it goes to the, these belt dryers um, that were the aliquot switch um, dryers. Then it goes to the gasifier, which you can see the hearth there. Um, the hearth is heated to around 650 degrees um, with, under controlled oxygen conditions. And then the, it goes to an oxidizer, which is at 850 degrees. 
after the heat is recovered, um, it then goes back to our dryers, which then dries our biosolids to 90% dry. So that's that renewable energy step. Um, and then our end product is biochar. So that means that we have sequestered carbon into our biochar, um, and that's really ex important to our end users. And it's also that heat energy recovery where we can use that, um, what we're producing, to actually um, dry our biosolids, which is not what's um, usually done in any of the other water industry. Um, I suppose, yes, one of the, two of the concerns that we're having um, in the industry is around emerging contaminants of concern, and that's include microplastics and PFAS. So through gasification, we're actually able to destroy 98% um, of, of the PFAS that are in our biosolids, um, and we've now got a license that says a destruction rate of 99%. So. Um, we're very sure that we're going to be able to get there. Um, the 98% was based off uh, biosolids that we'd sourced from elsewhere, so that was fine. Um, the microplastics, so in Australia, we've got um, about 2,800 to 19,000 tonnes of microplastics in our biosolids that are going into the agronomic sector. So we know that it's there. Um, these are actually ones from the Logan Home um, biosolids, so we know that it is in our biosolids as well. Um, and they're destroyed through the process. Um, so this is how we're going to achieve our circular economy um, and it's really looking at instead of producing that 14% very wet um, biosolids, we're going to be producing biochar which is 90% dry and sequestered carbon. It does destroy um, PFAS, so the, uh, PFAS and it does destroy our microplastics and nanoplastics um, and it also has even though it's a, it is a really stable form of carbon, it also um, has a water holding capacity as well, which is great for agronomic use. So um, there are uh, lots of value in biochar. Um, we're just, we've just constructed the gasification facility, so we're two weeks in um, and in our commission, in commissioning phase. Uh, so this is a way that we're going to get to our carbon neutral um, vision for Logan City Council. So water utilities are in a very unique position um, to lead the way in adapt adaptation, resilience and circular economy. So we're changing the view of our treatment plants from the need to dispose of waste to producing a product. So the, there are resource recovery hubs with potential products such as biochar, water, energy, nutrients and metals. So we just need to figure out a better way as, um, to utilise them so that we can open up the market and achieve a circular economy. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to all our speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, it's great to see ag and, uh, and wastewater uh, talking today and uh, the projects that are uh, under development and, uh, uh, and on the ground truly are an inspiration to, to all of us in this room. So I'm um, really pleased to, uh, to, to hear more about them. Um, I guess before we throw to questions, I just thought I'd... I'd uh, I talk about some of the work that Bioenergy Australia are leading um, with regards to biomethane. Uh, and, and Tiana mentioned earlier that uh, she was leading the Renewable Gas Association. Now, now what that means is that you know, there are three separate work streams that uh, this organisation is, is focusing on. Um, one of those work streams is the creation of incentives and policy that would support uh, biomethane. Um, and it's not widely known, but if you were to inject gas into the grid today and you were to transport it up the road and pull it out, if you were using that gas, you wouldn't be able to report an emission reduction. Now that's crazy. Um, so when we talk about policy, we're not just talking about um, subsidies, we're talking about removing barriers to support the uptake of bioenergy. Um, so in this particular case, we're looking for Certification, we're looking to leverage off the hydrogen uh, sector who are developing a hydrogen guarantee of origin. Um, now, one of the other work streams is digestate. We heard a lot about that today. And, uh, and you know, digestate isn't treated uh, equally across each state and territory. Um, in some states, we treat it as industrial waste, even though it may have come from agriculture. So that adds cost to projects, and it makes it challenging to stack up even with the 2% cost of capital that, <laughs> that David highlighted, it's hard to get those, those projects to work. 
Um, and then the other work streams around gas injection. Um, today we've got a gas injection standard that follows the natural gas um, uh, standard, AS4564. It's not designed for biomethane. And, and what that means is that there are some consi constituents of concern, which is a, a term that we use, that are unique to biomethane, not in natural gas. And, and what that means is that, strictly speaking, we probably can't get it into the pipe and comply with AS4564. So, so there's lots of, um, lots of work that these guys are doing, and these conferences provide us the resources to chase down those various work streams. So, to that end, I thought I'd just throw the first question out and, uh, and ask our, our panel here um, what the single biggest barrier is from your point of view with regards to um, the bioenergy project that you're looking to develop. I'm happy to start. Thanks, Mark. Um, for us, uh, and thinking about this early and thinking about it quite simplistically, the the feedstock, um, high concentration of poultry manure, we needed some blended other, other agricultural waste streams, whether it be some sort of pig slurry or, or some other sort of agricultural feedstock. So um, majority poultry manure, fine, a, a blend of something else, solvable. Uh, technology to actually make the biogas. Again, technology is evident. We've seen some plants here today and there's, there's plenty all over the world. Um, it's probably that next piece that Mark has just touched on. Um, the revenue, the monetization, getting it into the network, getting it out of the network, getting that recognised, dealing with the digestate. It's a lot of those sort of um, barriers and hurdles are, re are really what need to be broken down and dealt with. And obviously the, um, the return hurdles around that as well. Yeah, I could probably go next. I did, um, didn't mention in, in my presentation, we're actually in the process of developing a second facility in the eastern um, metropolitan region of Lilydale, a 50,000 tonne capacity facility. So we're, this is very fresh for us at the moment um, in terms of going through the risk um, and the business case development for that facility. It, it is following the same process as Woolert, which means that we, we do need to present a, a positive business case for that project. Um, the higher, the, one of the highest risks um, for us Victor in Victoria locally is the regulation. So um, the regulator in Victoria doesn't see uh, AD uh, or bioenergy as, a <laughs> um, as anything uh, to, to really be applauded. They think it sits there just, just sort of between recycling and, and going to landfill. Um, so they don't fully appreciate um, the full benefit and the circular um, economy component of it. Um, we live at the moment in this little grey space where up until very recently, waste to energy didn't want to acknowledge um, anaerobic digestion. Organics didn't want to acknowledge anaerobic digestion. So we just kind of existed in this little area in between taking bits and pieces, um, whatever suited the regulator on the day, basically. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing a bit of a shift in that now. Um, and, and that's given us the assurance, uh, assurity around the Lilydale project. Um, that's the front end and the approvals and planning side of things. So um, very risk averse in that, in that um, scenario. And then number two is, is that back end component around the digestate. So um, like you said earlier, considered an industrial waste um, up here in Queensland, thankfully, um, that barrier seems to be dissolving rapidly with a draft publication um, for reuse classification. So we're hoping to, to push um, a similar sort of pathway for the regulator down um, in Victoria with Lilydale. Um, and we've basically said to the regulator, if, if we can get this um, proposal across the line around the digestate management, the investment is just going to come in, into the um, into the state for AD because uh, we've built our business cases with digested as a cost at this um, uh, point in time, but we're very very comfortable that once the approval pathway um, and process is realised, um, the digested is actually going to become a, a very attractive revenue stream for us. Um, we've got significant significant interest from the ag industry fertiliser manufacturers and the like, and a few other left field um, uh, uh, industries around the reuse of that material. So um, those, those two components probably are what we hear in Victoria as um, some of those barriers. And I won't go into the gas stuff because I think we're a bit premature for that as an AD industry still. Fantastic, thank you. Any others? <laughs> um, yeah, in our, in our situation will be the technology. Um, we're hoping the technologies we are going to employ 
uh, they do come up to scratch and um, become commercially viable. Uh, some of the technologies are viable now. We hope we can get the whole, whole plan together and all the technologies working at once. Um, I think the investment money there is there. Um, I think the offtake is already there, but um, it'll be just meshing the technologies together. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think it's a vexed question. It's almost energy play by energy play, to be honest. Um, every play's got a different set of challenges. So same for cogen, putting electrons into the grid, extreme price volatility, and we're seeing that right now. Um, how do you make a 20-year decision when, bounces are when prices are bouncing from minus 1,000 to, to 600? A megawatt hour, um, and and what does that transition to renewables look like going forward? Um, what will be the role of firming or baseload power? Uh, what, wh where will government play in these markets going forward? There's just so much um, transition associated uncertainty there at the moment. Uh, on on fuel by fuel play, um, it's cost competitiveness. How do we how do we get in the queue uh, as a biofuel play uh, going forward with uh, the airlines? How do we know we're going to get there one day where we're going to be a preferred um, you know, fuel of choice? Uh, biomethane, again, cost competitiveness. We know the world is screaming and the domestic market is screaming for green gas. Um, what does that price look like? The domestic price is paired to the international price, as we all know. Again, price volatility there. Will we, um, will, we, will we get remunerated for our positive externalities? That's economics jargon for will we get rewarded for doing uh, and supplying green, um, you know, green gas? Will the market reward us at the moment in the absence of a carbon price, for example? Uh, so lots of our market uncertainty there and volatility around what the, what the market looks like over the next period as we transition to a decarbonised um, global and domestic economy. Thanks, David. Any others? <laughs> Very good. Well, look, uh, I might throw to the audience. Uh, do, do we have any questions for our panellists today? Yeah, hi, Nick from AJ Bush & Sons. Uh, this one's a bit more for Stephanie. So um, you did touch on a little bit in your presentation about foreign bodies, but I just uh, wanted to, I guess, find out about uh, your management processes and how that, in fact, uh, impacts the process of the facility that you guys operate. Just to clarify, feedstock contamination, is that...? Yes. Uh, so that, that was a huge concern in terms of feedstock um, quality and quantity um, for um, pre-commissioning, I guess. What we've actually seen um, and realised through our um, facility, and, and I think scale, the scale of our facility has a lot to do with that. When you look at um, some of the projects that have been discussed um, at this forum, 30,000 tonne per annum isn't, isn't a huge amount, um, which means that we're able to be... Um, work really closely with our customers around ensuring the, the quality of the stream that comes to us. Um, we have had nothing but success with that. So, um, you know, I think last year was the first year we had to have our contamination penalty set um, on a customer since our commissioning. So um, we work very closely around expectations. We have a closed gate facility, which means that not anyone can just turn up. All feedstocks are scrutinised. Um, we look at the quality, we look at the, um, both from a contamination perspective, but also from the methane potential. Um, and, and that sort of sets where our, our gate fee will go for a particular feedstock. So um, another, another benefit for us that we've found, and one of the reasons that's led us to have success to be able to deliver a second facility, is that um, the, the waste market is screaming for this type of service, um, offering for their customer base and waste producers are also looking for this. We've got a, a high landfill levy in Victoria and high landfill costs, so um, the incentive is there to, to um, move away from landfill. So um, the, the fact that we have a finite capacity, um, it's, it makes it quite competitive for the waste producers to be able to secure their, their um, disposal with us. So in, in that, um, they are very tidy <laughs> around what they bring to us. So um, we don't have any decontamination infrastructure at Woolert. 
Um, we rely purely on our customers to do that bit for us, and they do. Um, at uh, the Lilydale facility, we will be installing some decontamination um, process just because we have a bigger capacity and we wanted to tap into um, a little bit more of that market. And also our customers are asking for it um, for the post plate consumer type of waste. So they want to be able to recover from retail, they want to be able to recover from hospitality, um, hotels and the like. So um, events is another really big one where um, there's a huge focus on recovery of organics. So food festivals and music festivals and things. So so um, we will have some decontamination um, uh, processes on the front end, but that will be coupled with a higher cost of the gate fee for us. So. Right, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, Luke Brennan from Guy Envirotech here. And, and just a question for Sam on some of the work that you were doing. Um, interested to hear, I suppose, your... Um, insights into those more sort of centralised, bigger hubs versus, and you mentioned it in your in your presentation, versus more a sort of distributed kind of mini hub type model, um, and some of the learnings that you, you found through your work there. Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the, the trade-offs in distance were the first sort of piece we looked at. With one centralised hub, you're going to be transporting your feedstock a lot further. That's a dollar per tonne cost. Not all feedstocks have the same energy density, so that does sort of paint a bit of a complicated picture, but um, one of the biggest challenges is just rounding out the utilization of the plant through the year. And if you are distributing your hubs at a particular feedstock location, if that's not available through the year, the plant utilization goes, goes right down. Whereas um, if you have a big centralized hub, we looked at this for Griffith in New South Wales, this is a bit of a, a test case. Um, you have a better shot at sort of managing a feedstock calendar through the year and just having a more regular supply and um, that sort of really helped the economics of the plant sort of tip back in the favour of those large scale sort of uh, hubs as opposed to the more distributed ones. Yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, Sam. And, and, and look, maybe just to add to that, uh, I know through, and I hope, Ben, you don't mind me saying this, but through the work that we're doing with, with AAM, uh, we've looked at increasing the scale of our projects to create hubs, so, you know, to bring in diverse feedstocks to um, effectively you know, increase the size of the plant. And what we found was really interesting. So, you know, the cost of producing biomethane halved if we were able to double the size of the plant. So, you know, the policy needed to encourage feedstock supply is really important. Um, the challenge we now face is that at that size plant, we can't get enough gas into the pipe. So, so we've got a market, but uh, well, we're constrained by the pipe. So, um, so yeah. Any other questions? No? Oh, one over here. Hi, I'm doing from my uh, University of Sunshine Coast. And I um, have a question for, uh, for your teams. So I'm quite interested about the graphs and you show the data for different fields for potential um, energy in different fields about forestry, agriculture, and biomark waste. So I just wondering why the different, quite significant difference between uh, Queensland and Tasmania. So in Tasmania, it's a forestry contribute about ninety percent of uh, bioenergies, but in Queensland we only has seven seven percent. And do you think it's a to be more potential for investigating about the forestries because the more biomass we collect, so it should be more bioenergy we produce. And in forestry, so we waste a lot of the biomass from because we only use with the wood timber and all the components like branches or leaves or foliage. So um, foliage or park. So we haven't used, and currently we also burn and release a lot of uh, carbon dioxide in atmosphere. Yeah, that's my question. Um, yeah. Well, I, I so, I mean. The large scale amounts I was showing there, Tasmania didn't actually uh, get filled in in there. That's just in terms of the quantity of residue compared to the rest of the country, we weren't sort of identifying those really large scale projects. But when we looked at the distribution lines, um, there were much more opportunities for smaller scale projects like we've heard about today because um, the feedstock's less competitive in that region as well. Um, we weren't looking at forestry because that's a bit too dry t for the anaerobic digestion sort of technology. but um, yeah, what we sort of found is that 
the biggest question mark that happens in the biggest states like Queensland and New South Wales is where's, was, where's this feedstock currently being used? How much of this is actually available um, for biomethane sort of projects? And that's where there's lots of sort of use of the sugarcane sort of emerging at the moment. And um, so Tasmania had a bit less competition for its feedstocks with those small scale projects. So there's great opportunity there for a feedstock supply, I think. But um, yeah, it, that's why it wasn't a focus of our, our assessment uh, today. Right, thanks, Sam. Ben, you uh, you mentioned you had some forestry assets under management. Uh, just leading on from that question, do you see any opportunities with anaerobic digestion or other bioenergy um, solutions from from that part of your business? Yeah, so we um, we process and deal with quite a lot of softwood regrowth, radiata pine, um, <clears throat> and interestingly enough. Uh, look, five or ten years ago, residues from processing businesses were a, were a, a challenge and a problem. Uh, some of those residues are used in boilers to kiln dry the, the timber that goes into uh, commercial construction and house frames and things like that. What we've seen is a, a fair bit of expansion as well in MDF and particle board. So what was previously a waste and a residue is actually a valuable feedstock to a uh, another business, um, and those businesses are also taking the the bendier tree or the or the earlier thin tree. So that whole the whole softwood plantation and processing industry is pretty well in sync at the moment. There's not a lot of waste out of it like there like there was previously. But look, there is some opportunity with pelletisation, um, wood fuel pellets, uh, things like that. Anaerobic digestion, I I, I don't think so, mainly because of the bug's ability to break it down, but maybe gasification or something like that. But the, the, the challenge is you go to a processing business and say, have you got a problem with your waste? They're going to say, no, it's actually a, a valuable um, feedstock to another business. So not really much of a waste anymore. Yeah, good, good response, Ben. And, and when, I, uh, when we approach Ben with our project, the first thing Ben said is, don't talk about waste, we don't produce waste. Everything we pr produce is of value. So we started changing our terminology to feedstock, and what we want to do is intercept that feedstock. So, <laughs> so um, look, guys, thank you for uh, for uh, your attention today. Uh, I'm sure you'll agree that uh, the quality of our speakers was fantastic. The projects are exciting. Um, you know, when when I embarked on this journey two years ago, uh, someone said to me, "This stuff's not for the faint-hearted." Um, and uh, I'm sure you'll agree that uh, it takes courage to get up here today and it also takes courage to, to invest in these projects and get behind bioenergy. So let's, uh, let's thank these guys in the usual way with a round of applause. Excellent. So what's the uh, sequence of events? <laughs> Food, okay. We've got... Uh, Afternoon tea, what time are we reconvening? And we'll reconvene at 3.30. <laughs>